but elsewhere, they were remarkable stories of survival. We headed north towards the tsunami's furthest reaches, through areas still uninhabitable, where thousands have been moved to evacuation centers, waiting for their towns to be rebuilt. We were searching for a particular remote bay. When I saw this footage back in the UK, it didn't look like any of those people on the ground were running fast enough to escape. So we've come to the place that it was filmed to see if there were any survivors. <laughs> Mrs. Akiko Iwisaki, a local hotelier, was one of those in the video. First, I went up the mountain and got everyone to evacuate. Then she went back down to warn the others. Mrs. Iwasaki took me to the place where the video was shot. You can see her running with a bag. I was wearing these baggy trousers and Wellington boots, and I was carrying bags. I ran as fast as I could. <laughs> She doesn't know how close the water is until the last moment. You can see the wave pick up the bus on the left and spin it towards her. A bus had come up beside me. The bus was there. The wave was there. I was sure we would make it as I stepped up. But she didn't. Mrs. Iwasaki was dragged under. She's in the water somewhere beneath the bus. I could see a faint light from above, so I swam towards it and reached out my hands and grabbed on, thinking it was a piece of debris. I bumped into the tire of that bus, then I frantically climbed up to the roof, then I grabbed onto a bamboo cane over here on the mountain. I want to live, I want to live. The water reached the third floor of the hotel, but she and everyone else in the footage survived. I think I was protected by the gods and by my ancestors. But for some who survived the wave, there was something else to contend with, an invisible legacy from the nuclear power station on the coast of Fukushima. Its seawall was designed to withstand a tsunami up to five and a half meters. This was twice the height. The flooding short-circuited cooling pumps. The reactors began dangerously overheating. We managed to track down one of the nuclear workers on site at the time. Before the disaster happened, I thought nuclear power was 100% safe. It was precisely what people call the safety myth. 25 hours after the quake, pressure in reactor number one built up, then it exploded. It was the biggest nuclear accident since Chernobyl, in a country reliant on nuclear power. When reactor one exploded, I was in the middle of evacuating from my home to the evacuation center specified by the town authorities. I was in the car, as the roads were chock-a-block. I was in the traffic jam. Cars were hardly moving. He didn't know it, but radiation was already leaking from the plant, and those stuck in traffic had no protection. I'm prepared for the fact that probably we suffered some external and internal radiation exposure. Ken Tagawa and his family now live in a sports center with other nuclear evacuees. He's had medical tests which show he has been exposed to high doses of radiation. But it's children who are more vulnerable. His youngest wears a radiation monitor at all times. He's still unsure how much exposure they've already suffered. Dangerous levels of radiation are still widespread around the Fukushima plant. 
The government's evacuated all towns and villages in a 20-kilometer radius. They're still too dangerous to return to six months on. The Tagawas lived in Namia, well within the exclusion zone. But today, he and his wife are going back in. Just for a couple of hours, it's all they're allowed. It's an operation being overseen by the Japanese military, scientists and the Red Cross. Dozens of other evacuees have also signed up, despite the risk. Under heavy escort, they're bussed through the roadblocks and into the exclusion zone. Mr. Tagawa is filming the journey for us. There's an eerie emptiness. Deserted fields are overgrown and poisoned. The levels of radiation here are still dangerously high six months after the leak. When fleeing, we came just with the clothes on our backs, and we didn't have any of the things we needed. I wanted to go and fetch these things, and that's why I returned, despite the risk, for the sake of the children. This was their home. Windows and doors left open. There's no one here to loot. Mrs. Tagawa can be heard calling for the missing cat. It never comes. Inside, the house is just as they left it after the earthquake. It may be the last time they come here. These towns could remain abandoned for generations. All of that has helped turn Japanese public opinion against nuclear power. Of the country's 54 reactors, 43 are currently out of operation. But nowhere has touched the Japanese nation as deeply as the story of a group of schoolchildren. A mile away from the sea, along the Kitakami River, is the town of Okawa with its long iron bridge. There was a junior school here, right at the heart of the community. This was last year's sports day. The pupils, aged between 6 and 12, are lined up and ready to compete. This was Okawa before the 11th of March. You can see the school in the foreground. This was the scene when the wave receded. The school clocks frozen at the time the wave hit. We traced a 12-year-old survivor. He agreed to tell us about what happened on the day he lost so many friends. <laughs> When the earthquake happened first, we all took cover under our desks. As the shaking gradually got stronger, everyone said things like, Wow, it's big, you okay? Looking very worried. When the shaking stopped, the teacher straight away said, We'll go to the gymnasium, so follow me outside. So we all put on our helmets and went out. Tetsuya's mum rushed to the school to pick up her children and drive them to higher ground. When she arrived at the school, it seems that she actually wanted to flee with me to higher ground. But as all the parents and guardians were lining up, she said, wait a minute, I need to fetch something from home. So I just handed over my bags to her and stayed there. They lived just down the road. His mother hoped to be back in a matter of minutes. Immediately after the earthquake, the children were brought outside here and made to sit down in lines. And then some of the teachers said, 
it's not safe enough. We need to evacuate right up the hillside there. And others said, you know what, this is high enough. We don't need to go anywhere else. That debate went on for about 40 minutes. Unknown to them, the tsunami was close. It didn't need the river to carry it. It was traveling across land. Another parent wanted to pick up her daughter, but was trapped at home. It was only later she learned what had happened to the children between the quake and tsunami. During the entire 40 minutes that followed the earthquake, the children were just sitting there, crying in the playground. After 40 minutes, some of the teachers finally decided to move the children to slightly higher ground, over there, by the bridge. But the decision was too late. As the children walked towards the bridge, the tsunami came straight at them. When it hit me, it felt like a huge gravitational pull, like someone with great strength pushing. I couldn't breathe. I was struggling for breath. Tetsuya was thrown against this hillside, buried up to his waist in mud and trapped beneath a broken branch. When I called for help, somebody shouted, Where are you, Tetsuya? So I said, in the mountain. Then they dug for me, and somehow with my own strength, I squirmed upwards and was saved. Tetsuya's little sister, Mina, was drowned. His mother, who'd rushed home, never made it back to school. Her body was found three weeks later. Out of 108 pupils at the school, 74 lost their lives. Naomi's 12-year-old daughter was one of them. Koharu had been due to graduate the following week. Still, after five months of searching, her body hadn't been found. I realized that once the authorities stopped searching, We'd have to do it ourselves, because there was no way we could give up until our children were found. I just wanted to find her with my own hands, to do whatever I could. I heard that if I could get a heavy equipment license, they might lend us another machine to help the parents search. I wanted not only to find my daughter, but also to do something to help find the other five children and the teacher who was still missing. So that's why I got my license. It was in August that Kaharu's body was finally found, not by the digger, but washed up on a beach seven miles from the school. A week later, Japan held its annual ceremony for the dead, the Oban Festival. This year, a nation was united in grief. Naomi, with the rest of her family, launched a lantern for the spirit of her daughter, Kaharu. Another 4,000 people are still missing. Each phase of rebuilding these flattened towns and cities is being meticulously mapped out. They think it could take 10 years. But a whole generation of families have suffered loss that can't be repaired. The history inside the Queen's Palace is here, Maidstone, BBC One.